let me let me tell you about that um this this guy posted this drawing on twitter like oh what is this four years ago i think and i saved it and i i i sent him a message on twitter and said you know i love your drawing can i use it and he said yeah and he sent me this file uh an svg file and what's svg uh scalable vector graphic it's a web um display drawing format um and so but and i and i tried opening it in in my drawing program uh and i open it and there's nothing there you know and i was like fuck uh whoops <laughs> and Darn. so um so a couple of years later i opened it back up and i thought you know what maybe it's off the uh maybe it's off the the scale as it were and as it was it turned out to be way off to the right i i got it in the screen and um so if i recall correctly uh he's in brazil and uh i don't i don't know how you know what prompted him to to draw this maybe he had one of these uh you know as a kid or something but i just love the drawing even though as an isometric drawing it's a little wonky uh if you if you look at it closely you see it sort of warps from, from one <laughs> corner to the other <laughs> or it doesn't follow isometric uh drawing standards uh, <clears throat> at least as i learned them in junior high school shop what is it 30 30 degrees is that what it's supposed to be for isometric yeah yeah i took I mean, uh, some classes in high school too and i <laughs> I think it was something like that. It's yeah. good times. It's good times. Um, Scott Harden, are you new to us? Hi. I am new. Okay, I thought I recognized Long time name. lurker, first time joiner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Scott, um, since there's only a few of us, let's do some round robin introductions. Why don't you start? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I've uh, I gone back and I've watched the uh, the former videos that you guys have recorded and uh, just thought I would introduce myself. Um, I guess a little bit uh, about me. I started on uh, when I was 12 on a TS 1000, bought it myself, uh, saved up all, all summer mowing lawns. Um, <laughs> the next year, uh, my parents uh, got together with the whole family and bought me the 2068. So I had that for a number of years. Um, I really didn't you know, after, when I got into college, I didn't uh, I didn't mess with them much. And they were up in my mom's attic uh, mm. until about two years ago when she told me she had uh, donated everything. <gasps> to. <laughs> so, at least, at least she didn't throw it away. She did not throw it away. No, yeah. no, she's she's very much uh, a donator. And uh, so I'm hoping that somebody is uh, is living uh, my childhood dreams. With I might my, have your uh, machine. Who knows? You might actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a couple of years ago, I got back into uh, kind of the 8-bit retro scene, just really um, just to have a hobby. And it turned into a little bit of a uh, restoration uh, kind of gig. I do um, primarily I buy old uh, disused speckies over in the UK and ship them over here. And I try to give them a new loving home in the US mm -hmm. since they're kind of hard to find here. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, but my true love and first love has always been the Timex Sinclair. So, nice. Um, so Adam, you asked about disk systems. I see that Jay Siegel yeah. just joined us and he has, let me think if I recall correctly, the zebra floppy disk system. He might have some other ones. Oh, is that that 3000 or? Yeah, the, the three or the 3000, depending upon the, the way it's set up. Uh, well, Scott, we're glad to have you with us. Um, I you. see uh, Joachim. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Yes, hi, Joachim. It's from mm. from France. Oh, cool. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, okay, so uh, I got. Uh, hold on one sec. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, maybe you see my my camera now. Um, yeah, you can. Yeah. So, uh, right this way. <clears throat> so I, I got my first uh, ZX Spectrum when I was ten. I still have it right now. Um, 
then I went to uh, my second computer was an Amiga. Uh, and uh, I guess that uh, I learned programming on I learned programming on basic uh, on the ZX spectrum. And uh, currently I'm uh, uh, that a computer uh, uh, software engineer. Uh, I have a consulting company here in France. And uh, well, I guess that uh, the, 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 the origin of my job uh, is uh, on the ZX Spectrum and on the Commodore Amiga. Oh, very cool. <clears throat> um, Adam, why don't you go next? see uh hi uh, i'm adam i live in uh, new mexico here in the united states um and that's a state that's between texas and arizona <laughs> it exists um i live in albuquerque which is the biggest city here it's about 500,000 people or so and uh i have a, a 2068 uh, the time and sinclair version and uh, no other uh, uh products from the company um i didn't get into the system really until um about 2009, I picked up a couple of them or three of them because when you buy one, you've got to get more just in case. And um, <laughs> and uh, that is good because I killed one of them uh, trying to do an upgrade on it. So yeah, now Carl Miles has that and he said he might be able to fix it. Uh, and I've been messing around with basic and I've gone through some of the books and uh, I, I guess my uh, first uh, joy of the computers I have is my uh, Astrocade. I have a website dedicated to it called um, valleyalley.com. And I'd like that they're both um, Z80 chips. Uh, I've done some uh, machine language programming and of course, basic programming. Um, and I've uh, dug out one of my uh, uh, spectrum programming books and um, I might mess around with that and see if I can't convert the program that's in there. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard, I guess, because the source code's in there to make it run in the native 2068 mode because eh, it'd be fun. Yeah, that's about it. Cool. Uh, Jay, you want to say yeah. hi and do a little intro? Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Okay, yeah, I, right now. <laughs> um, I'm doing my laundry at the laundromat. I'm here in Chicago. And uh, I have a TS-2068 with a FDD-3000. I have a couple of them. One, one needs repair. Um, I also have the, the 1000, the 1500 with the cartridge uh, reader there. I don't have the, uh, any cartridges for it. I also have the Larkin system for the 1000. I have a whole bunch of Memotech stuff for the 1000. And my second computer is the Amiga. I have a couple 2000, uh, 4000, and uh, some 1200s and a 500. And um, I have a lot of stuff for the uh, FDD 3000 uh, set up for uh, CPM 2.2. Uh, so uh, that's uh, what I've got. Um, can someone tell me how to mute my uh, mic? On your phone, I'm not sure, but I can mute you if you'd like. <laughs> Sure, why don't you do that? Because I don't want to add to the background noise. Okay. Uh, who's Larry? All right, well, uh, we'll go to uh, Jeff. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself or tell our newcomers about you? Sure. Um... I'm a, a Timex user. I got my first one, uh, Timex 1000, back in the mid 80s when I was 30 ish years old, and uh, then moved on to uh, 2068 about uh, in the early 90s. And then after that, boogied off into Apple computers and, uh, and IBM PCs. And I've gotten back into retro computing. I'm primarily a hardware nerd. Um, I consider software to be a necessary evil with a, uh, an emphasis on evil. <laughs> so that's like a mainframe uh, sysadmin's view towards users. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say I'm, I'm slightly on the negative side of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, may, may I ask you something, Jeff? 
Can you hear me? Sure. Uh, well, you said you got your first 2068 in the early 90s. Did you happen across it in a newspaper ad or something? Because that's kind of late to be picking up one of those systems. I mean, late. Here we are talking about it now. But I mean, late for the time period, people weren't usually collecting or anything, I don't think, then. So how'd you get yours at that time? It's kind of odd. I was I was I really had a soft spot for Timex computers. And a friend of mine um, had a 2068. Uh, I was stationed in the Air Force in, in Omaha at the time. And uh, he wanted to get rid of it, and I decided I'd go ahead and take it from him. And uh, I liked the computer and did some, at the time I was teaching electronics, so I was using it uh, for doing some course development work. And then uh, just kind of kept it from then on until I burned it up uh, in the early, the late 90s, early 2000s. Did you say burned it up? Is that what you said? Yeah. Oh, there's a story there, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, one that I'm not happy about. <laughs> We've all been there. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the problem when you're a hardware nerd. If you make one one little mistake. Yeah, yeah it, it doesn't take much. Um, Joao, you want to say hi? We've got a couple of newcomers. That's why we're doing a... Little introductions around the table. Yeah, sorry guys, I arrived a little bit later. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. I think I was in the last meeting, uh, talking for a long, a long period about the museum over here in Portugal, where I'm based. Um, so yeah, bottom line, I'm so being Portuguese, I have a, a very fun. Connection with with Timex computers, uh, but also with the uh, with the Sinclair ones, and uh, from the collection that I started ten years ago, I, I created a, a museum focused on the on the all things Sinclair and Timex, and yes, that's been the the story I've been let's say sharing and and trying to make grow every day. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I've been talking. From time to time with David about some details. Uh, I remember one thing we, we discussed recently uh, because we, we keep adding uh, pieces to the puzzle uh, and that, that helps to investigate further what happened in Portugal, in US and everywhere. And finally, uh, so I, I'm not saying this because I want to sell you anything, but uh, so yesterday we started the, the pre-sale of our first book in the museum. It's not written by me. It's by a friend of mine, Andre, who's been doing a huge effort of uh, preservation of Portuguese software. So the book is called The Portuguese Programmers for the ZX Spectrum, Sinclair, and, and Timex machines. So I don't know, five years ago, we knew something like 20 or 30 programs. Programs, I mean, both games and educational software. And nowadays, they were able to, to investigate until we reach at something like 1,000. Uh, obviously, some type pins also, but it's a, it's a huge amount of work. And so he, he wrote a book that is the first one we are launching with the brand of the museum that covers everything the, in terms of... What, lang what language is it written in? Sorry? What language is it written in? Is it going to be English? Uh, uh, b both basic, both... Uh, well, oh, oh, the language of the book. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's in Portuguese. That's why I said I was not uh, think of, of trying to sell you anything. Uh, oh, but see. it's written in Portuguese. For now, it's the, um, it's the only language. Uh, but it, it started very well to the, yesterday and today. Uh, a lot of sales. Uh, so, and all of this... So the book will be available on the 23rd of April, which is the day that the Spectrum celebrates 40 years. It's World's Book Day, Book Day. So we are launching it on the World's Book Day, and we are having um, an international event in in Portugal in in the museum. For by by international, I mean I have some speakers from the UK. Some will come. Some will participate remotely. I've been thinking a lot about what to do concerning Timex because there are huge plans about Timex over here, but I don't want to mix things up. So probably I won't push too much for Timex in this event and I will leave it for after um, because um, it, 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 we need something dedicated to it. Uh, but so, yeah, so I've been making some contact and paying attention to what's happening and what can we share with the community. Very cool. Um, 
so I'll put your URL for your thing in the in the chat so folks have it. You I mean, will, I'll, yeah, we'll, I'll we'll plug it at the end and stuff, but you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Keith, you want to say hi to the new folks? Your mic's your mic's off, Keith. <laughs> yeah, it should be on now. Yeah. Uh, I got into computing. Uh, just kicking and screaming. I didn't want to. My brother-in-law, he was uh, uh, kind of an executive with NCR in, in the computer industry, but uh, he always was trying to get me to get into it. But uh, my boss uh, had some information in the early 80s that we, uh, computers were going to be forced onto us where we worked. And uh, he wanted me to find out everything I could about what how it would uh, be an advantage for us. I, I knew nothing about computers, so I, I took an adult class where everybody in the class had a Commodore except me and I'd had nothing but I went out and bought one of those Timex 1000s, learned how to program it. Uh, then I, I told you before we had a need for calculating horsepower more accurately at uh, where I worked and uh, I used the uh, 1000 to start with and then when the 2068 was advertised in a uh, Sears catalog I ordered one. Uh, really liked it, uh, found out that I, I should have been a programmer. <laughs> but, any case, uh, since then I've, I've bought two more 2068s, another 1000. I've got the Spectrum Plus. I've got uh, two Series One interfaces. One of my modified, so I could try to get it to work on a, a Timex uh, 2068. Not working very well in that yet, but uh, it works very well in the uh, what do you call it, the War Eagle uh, uh, emulator. That uh, the software I wrote, it works really good for that. Uh, so I got a lot of Timex books, a lot of Spectrum books uh, that I've collected over the years. I got into it. I think I was 38 or 39 when I got my first 1,000. Wow, that's crazy. Because to me, everybody, you know, got it when they were 13. <laughs> I was an old man already. <laughs> I'm still an old man. <laughs> hey, Rick, you want to say hi and give us a little uh, about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is, is, is Richard Burt. I live in Ontario, Canada. Uh, I've been interested in St. Clair computers since uh, I won one at a open house in 1981 in, from Nortel. Um, I have the uh, uh, ZX81, uh, TS1000. 2068 and uh, still operating. I use them for near every day. And uh, I've been in contact with David over fixing one, but we'll get, get on to that later on. So, and uh, I, I muchly enjoy just, just listening to you guys talk and that. So anyways, that's, that's my story. <laughs> Rick, were you a member of the Toronto Timex Sinclair group? Or was that uh, outside yes, of your was. reach? Yes, I was. Okay. Okay. Yes. They seemed pretty active. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was at the time. And uh, uh, actually, I, the one main guy there, uh, what's his name, George Chambers. George Chambers, yeah. Been to his place and picked some stuff up from him. And, that's that's so quite a ways back now though yeah 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 most most uh quite a few of the guys are gone there now so, yeah and uh actually i uh i got some uh software i just got in reused again um that george uh, sent me uh, oh really it wouldn't in a really interest. It's a uh, um, a Canadian tax program that he'd done. So, <laughs> so you, you're not using it to do your taxes now, are you? I mean, surely the tax law has changed. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, a lot of, a lot of, well, a lot of this laws have changed, but the, the the basic thing is still the same. You you just gotta. Add more percentage going to the government. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have that problem too. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Uh, 
Stuart, I'm guessing is Stuart Neufeld. So, Hi, Stuart. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I happen to be in State College, Pennsylvania, where for a year, uh, visiting my brother because he had uh, shoulder surgery earlier, earlier this week, so I'm playing uh, home care attendant for a while. Um, but this is actually where I have more of my Timex um, Sinclair products stored than in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> so I was visiting some things I haven't seen. In the last meeting, uh, I happened to mention these um, uh, RF modulators that I thought I had some. So actually, most of them are out here. Uh, I opened a box and found I have, <clears throat> they're all uh, the channel 36, um, not channel 2, 3 uh, Timex ones, but the ones that went into the ZX81s. Um, I actually have like a um, uh, like a blister pack of 20 new ones um, that you know were in my spare parts thing. So I figure um, that really got me thinking about what I'm going to do with that and some other items which really should be sold in Europe rather than here. I have a lot of uh, ZX81 cases and and ZXC ones that are assembled. Some are just from the repair center and they're just, just uh, the ZX81s, but I actually have some in full original Sinclair boxes with the styrofoam and the cables and everything. And I was thinking more and more, I, I, I need to find somebody in Europe who would like to sell them. So if anybody knows uh, a nice vendor, um, uh, 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 I'm looking to establish a relationship where at least, you know, for a kit, it doesn't matter. I, I can afford to, you know, I, I sell the kits uh, in Europe and they'll pay for shipping, but for a $15 modulator or something or $10 or 10 euro or whatever, <clears throat> I need to find somebody where the market is, where the shipping will be minimal and the delay times will be minimal. So. Anybody has recommendations? I'm looking around. I know I sold kits at least a decade two ago to Ian Pretty in the UK. I don't know if anybody's heard that name, but Ian has uh, sells a lot of cables and adapters for legacy computers, including spectrums and stuff. Not old ones, new ones that he gets from, I guess, China or something. So it, he has a website. Isn't, isn't it Ian Gladiel? No, I don't know that name. It's okay. Ian Pretty. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about those RF modulators, uh, Stuart. Um, yeah. Just, I didn't even know there were other modulators until yesterday when I was reading um, the David's book, and uh, he was talking about the UHF uh, mm. modulators because they had better reception uh, on the higher channels. Is is that correct? Like I've never heard of such a thing. And why would that be? I don't know. Well, there was less channel competition. I mean, most places there's no overlap between. Oh. You know, you don't have you don't have a channel two and a channel three, in in any given market, you know, and we don't have channel two or three anymore at all. But uh, you know, back then, <laughs> you didn't have channel two or three in any given market because the the bandwidth was right on top of each other. Um, but the UHF were. Also, we just use UHF here, for example. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. The UHF is, is is very popular in Europe, and so you know it didn't cost them anything to use the same use the same monitor uh, okay. modulator. Uh, <clears throat> but those those um, those are Aztec mo modulators, Stuart. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So th those were made for all kinds of different channels, um, and you know there's other uh, folks with some really old computers that may have some interest in them, you know, non sinclair folks yeah. that those are useful to. Well, yeah, when I look on the UK uh, eBay, uh, uk.co or whatever it is, um, there seems to be a fairly steady supply and sale of those modulators. So somebody's putting them in something and no one advertises them. I haven't, 
like I think right now there's like four up for sale. And when I look at the sold, four were sold in the last month in the $15 range. Um, and, um, but not a single one of them uh, stated what computer they're targeted for. So I didn't learn anything. I don't know if they're going to, I don't know what computers they're going into. So. <laughs> well, a, a lot of them uh, can be fitted into, I mean, there were different ones, but they can go into a whole bunch of different computers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what modular did they use in the, um, uh, the Bally? Oh, the Aztec or something? I, yeah. I have my system right there, I could open it, but. Uh, yeah. Watch out! Watch out! One tiny detail. Uh, as long, if I'm not mistaken, so the UHF and VHF modulator they have different references, but they also have another tiny detail which changes completely what is your target market, which is the position of the FCA connector is different. In one yep. is on the left, on the other is on the right, so it completely affects where where you can sell it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, and then somebody was talking about this recently. The ZX81s have um, uh, at least of the early, early ones that sold in the US have, have clearly two cutouts available for them, depending upon which modulator yeah. was used in it. But you know, the same um, happens with the TS1500. I have the, let's say the PAL version or UHF version, mm. which is the Portuguese one and the US one. And they, when you look to the case, they are different. You see the place to cut for the other. Yeah, the, the, other one. the mold mark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the mold mark, yes. Yeah. Um, so Larry, are you there? I'm not sure we got any audio from Larry. So I think that's everybody. So let's open the floor up. Who wants to jump in? <laughs> uh, well, I'll start. Uh, I, I've uh, I got David's oh. book. Yeah, which I don't know if it's. I don't think it's backwards for you guys. I hope not. Um, and I've been. Uh, I started reading it uh, yesterday, and I read like 100 and almost 150 pages. Um, here, I'll, I don't know if I can. It's thick. It's I don't know about two feet thick. <laughs> but it's it's a. Uh, I, I was hoping that uh, maybe David could tell us a little bit about how that came about because I asked him about it in private in an email and he said he doesn't want to push it because he feels that's not fair or something, but I would like to hear how it, how it happened. Okay, sure. Right. And, and when? Uh, so, um, well, it took me uh, uh, more than a few years of going through every single magazine and every single newsletter anything, anything I could get my hands on. And I cataloged everything that was ever listed, whether or not it, you know, came to be. And so all of that stuff went into a database that eventually became my website. And um, along the way, there were, um, I remember reading about a couple folks who put out essentially catalogs of stuff back in the 80s, right? Um, was a guy named Dale, uh, shoot, his last name is escaping me right now, who was a, a vendor of stuff. And he also put together this catalog around 85 or so. And at the time he said that there was something on the order of 600 vendors and roughly a thousand products or something in his catalog. It was a three ring binder uh, because he expected to expand it. And so one day I'm working on my website and it dawns on me that there's not any way to get a handle on the whole sort of picture of what was produced or what was announced at least. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's really hard to cuddle up with a website in bed, right? <clears throat> um, but you can take a book. Uh, and as it turns out, you know, it's a rather large one. Um, <clears throat> so I literally just exported everything and cleaned it up. And it took me took me a couple of months to turn it into something reasonable. Uh, yeah, and I did not expect it to be, what's it like, 500 and some odd pages. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty big. But that's insane. Not, that's great. Yeah. Well, and, and but, you know, so the, the things that surprised me were, A, the number of companies. It's, it's more than 900. The number of products, you know, across the, the spectrum is is more than three thousand. 
Um, and then, and then, you know, as I, as I say in the cover somewhere, you know, this is volume one because it's just the products, right? I've got, I've got the bibliography that I want to do all the articles and the books and et cetera, that got published. Um, <clears throat> and that's more of a, that's more of the library uh, past in me <laughs> in terms of putting it together. Um, and then I'm also working on um, a book just about the 2068 that will be, it'll include things like history, but it'll also, um, you know, include information from, from our favorite manual here, right? Uh, because when I see listings on, on eBay, you know, it's just the computer. And so there are people buying just the computer and they have no clue of how to use it, right? So I wanna make a book that says how to use it and the things that you can do with it. And, and it's history, the history of, really it's not the history of the computer, it's the history of the users. That's the part that fascinates me is, you know, how we've all held on so long, you know, I mean, the, the reason I mentioned the time, I, the Toronto group is that uh, the Toronto group lasted until the nineties. You know, and that was that was absolutely amazing. Uh, <clears throat> and there's um, who else was it? There was another group that produced the uh, uh, Sir Clive Alive, and they also lasted until the '90s. You know, for for a computer that started out as a tiny little uh, <clears throat> starter computer, theoretically, <laughs> um, and then. There's the, when I when I okay, can I uh, bring, bring something up about that. So yeah. I the used to groups I think um, have always been because I used to attend them in the in the nineties for the mm -hmm. Amiga and also the Atari, and also the Commodore sixty four. They had three separate user groups here, and they eventually faded away. I think the Amiga was the last one to go in about ninety nine or something like that. Um, but this is the closest I've ever seen to a, an actual like I mean the Zoom meeting I'm on currently to an actual user group meeting. Uh, I mean I have friends who are local and we get together and. Two of us or three of us, and we play around with some Ataris or whatever. Mm -hmm. But having a group of people, and uh, especially around the world, this is amazing to me. And to see someone who's opened up a museum for Timex is just blows my mind, you know. And I and I did watch that uh, the video for it after our last meeting, and it was a real museum. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't just a bedroom, you know, that <laughs> filled with crap. You know, it was stuff. Just, you know, I liked it. So uh, the fact that I don't know. If this will ever make more things happen or more hardware come out, but it's um, it's great to see a group of people who are like-minded um, get together and just chat. Yeah. So yeah, right. So this this was I don't, I don't know that I had this in mind when when I when I started building my website. My my goal was, I mean, it, it's it's I, I have a thing for it seems like. Um, uh, orphan or under underdog kinds of objects, right? So back in the back in the '90s, I bought this uh, uh, medium format camera that was made in Ukraine called the Kiev 88, and it's a clone of an early Hasselblad. It's not the one that you know the the that most folks um, uh, you know think of. Uh, before the Hasselblad 500, Hasselblad put out this 1000 and the, sh the shutter was in the body uh, versus in the lens, which is in the 500. And, and I was reading uh, Shutterbug and I saw a, uh, an announcement of a, of a newsletter for another obscure camera. And I thought, well, heck, if they have one, you know, people like me should have one. And so I started one and I, I published that for a couple of years. Um, was this a paper newsletter then? Yeah, yeah. It was called it was called the Kiev Report, and it was um, from about ninety six to about ninety uh, mid ninety nine, if I recall correctly. Hmm. Uh, and and I would I would lay it out on you know uh, I think I was using Quark at one point, and I would print it out on on eight and a half by eleven sheets, and then take it to the to the copy store and have it copied onto eleven by seventeen. And then I would take it home and collate it and fold it and staple it and mail it out. <laughs> These are the bad old days. <laughs> I, 
I actually used to have a newsletter too um, called Orphan Computers and Game Systems that was around from uh, 94 on and off till about 98. Yes. And um, if you can actually go to um, uh, orphangames.com and I have my back issues there and my friend Chris and I, we, uh, we still publish once in a while um, uh, uh, articles and put them up there. And uh, uh, it's he's actually written in the last week or so, he's been doing some fixes. So, I mean, that site has been around since 99 or something. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to have actual articles and if, I would be curious just to check out if you have a PDF of one of your articles or of one of your um, camera uh, ones. I'd like to check it out just because well, for think alike in that way, you know. Unfortunately, I lost all of that stuff in a flood <clears throat> with all my vinyl too. Um, so a couple of years ago, I uh, I read this this description of um, of an, a camera made by Ansco. Ansco used to be a competitor for Kodak and they are in Binghamton, New York. And Ansco uh, was was sort of at two ends. They made uh, large format, you know, the big five, uh, eight by 10 uh, view cameras. And then they also made little, um, uh, you know, consumer snapshot cameras. And at the end of World War II, they came out with this twin lens uh, uh, roll film camera that was intended to compete with the likes of the Rolly Flex. <clears throat> and um, they could compete for a couple of years because, because the German in, uh, companies were prevented from importing or producing anything, but also prevented from importing for, for a few years after World War II. And somebody likened it to, um, to a Hudson, I think. And I thought, wow, that's really unfair. And so I went out and got one, and then I started doing some digging. I ended up writing a book about that. That's also on Amazon. Um, but once I finished that, I was like, you know what? I really need to work on this this Timex website. <laughs> well, you, you're talking about like um, stuff like from Russia and things like that. And I know that the Spectrum um, had like all these clones that like, and some I guess it was extremely popular in in Russia. Yeah, so, yeah. The, know, the... I guess there's a whole hidden, at least hidden to me, story that's probably there to be written so i'm looking forward to your next book <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, i had um i had a, a chat a few months ago with a, a russian guy he's connected to a company that is kind of google there it's called yandex but yandex at the same time they have some activity in retro gaming they even organize a competition of games and one of my colleagues, the, the, the book author that I mentioned to you, is um, um, is a member of the jury there from time to time. So I, I was talking to this guy uh, from Yandex, and they were telling me something that I I, I suspicious. I was suspicious, but um, I'm even afraid to try to dig, which is they have something like 150 clones because every city was made making their own clone. So that makes it kind of a nightmare to, to investigate. There, there's a guy in the Netherlands, a good friend, Mark Kusterman, who is probably the guy that I know that has more clones. Uh, and he has a few from there and a couple of guys in UK also. But uh, from from Eastern Europe, I'm I'm pretty much just starting. So it's it's a lot of new information and complicated work. So yeah, in, in, to support what you said, a lot of those things end up on eBay now. Um, and you know you'll you'll see uh, the Pentagon and the Leningrad. Um, you know what's kind of funny is that uh, I I th think one of the earliest ones that I ever heard about was the the Obeta, the Hobbit, and and you never see that. You know it's always you know the Pentagon this and the Leningrad that. And <laughs> but there was also uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, folks who worked in electronics factories and they would smuggle home the parts and build their own. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely insane. But I mean, that's what you did, you know, in that. Now, are, are these spectrum clone? How would they clone a spectrum with just with part? I mean, they'd steal like the ULA and all that. Stuff. Well, that's the right. That's the part that I'm wondering about is, you know, yeah. how did they do that? No, it's, uh, it's but that's, individual... easy to, that's easy to explain because what, so what Clive Sinclair did was to hire Ferranti 
to make a custom chip that basically is made up of gates, okay? So they build it in a single chip to make it cheaper. Uh, what the guys did in Russia and Brazil and other places was to reproduce, for example, I think it's the Arlequin, which is done in US, yes. the clone yeah, from yeah. Don Superfull, which is based on, I think it's that one that doesn't use a, a new LA. It's filled with the TTL logic to replace the features of the ULA. So what they did in, in Eastern Europe, well, the concept is for sure the same. For sure. So that, that's basically backwards of what happened between the Z80 and the Z, ZX81. They, where they, they went from a ZX80, which was like all like custom, not custom ICs, to making like getting rid of 40 chips or something and coming up with yep. something that was cheaper. That's yep. different. <laughs> Does but it's funny because that... I have I have testimonies from the the guys in Portugal uh, that went to visit the UK and visit Ferranti, and they clearly told me. So we went there, we looked at their technology, and we said to ourselves, "We don't want this. This is not the future. The future is the gate arrays, the SCLD, and things like that." And that's why then they didn't use things from uh, Ferranti over here. Does anyone know the tally of the number of actual machines that the Russians built? I mean, are we talking hundreds or thousands or hundreds under different clones? Number of machines sold? I don't know. Do you mean variations, Jeff? Variations. No, I mean just the number, the the raw number of different machines that could be, from what you're saying, uh, Yao, that could be tens of thousands of. Of, of 10 of, of any given type. Yeah, yeah, but Jeff, you, we don't even know those numbers for the machines in Europe and US. So <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> everyone asks and no one really knows the number of machines sold, I think. Uh, um, one of the things I heard from Timex Portugal was we should have made a serial number procedure because we didn't do it and now <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. What oh, I'm happened. surprised. Yeah, they, they don't. They didn't have one. That was the definition of a homebrew over there. I mean, I mean, it really was. When you think about it, they would take the boards and someone would own one and they'd go to a different city and then they would build it around it and then they just replicate it and replicate it and replicate it. Yeah, I, I did read uh, several years ago that uh, in Russia, they actually were more based on disks than they were on tapes because there was some cheap disk system that came out in England and they just cloned it. And that's what most people would, would purchase over there. So they weren't so tape dependent like uh, the other countries or according to what I read, I don't know. I read it on the internet, so take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> it's gotta be true. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm just uh, trying to bring up an image of a, a Pentagon circuit, but go ahead, Adam. Um, I was gonna ask uh, eventually, it doesn't, if uh, how many people here have um, the systems that they actually have software for, and was there any commercial software released on disk for, I guess, any of these systems? Yeah, I, I had from my youth, not from collecting, in the in disks for the FDD from Timex, not much, but I had a few things like Art Studio, uh, some accounting software, some disk duplicator. But I was, I was probably, I don't think they sold many, but I was lucky because an uncle of mine gave me the FDD 3000 system. So I, I connected it to the, to the Sinclair 48K since my youth. Anybody I'll, else have, anybody else have one? What was the market penetration of the Timex computers in uh, Portugal? Huge. Uh, we don't have a number, but look, it's as simple as this. A kind of a poor country uh, coming out of a revolution uh, without tax, not part of European Union, anything like that. So everything was complicated and was new. And then you had a factory locally making some of those computers. So it's not like I can give you a number, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like so. Computers, uh, percentage of computers from Timex slash Sinclair in the house of Portuguese people for those that have a computer, I would say something like 90% or something like that because you had a few Commodores, of course, you had a few Ataris, but that would be the exception. Some Amstrads because people going to France and bringing an Amstrad because they were also very popular there. But, but 
time time x slash sinclair was the relevant the the main one now for example i didn't have time x computers i had sinclair machines don't ask me why uh but um but the fact is that people refer to the spectrum as a time x 2048 the pc 2048 or or any other so they were very 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 popular and because we didn't have the bbc micro or any of the other computers that were very famous elsewhere then it make it a clear market leader i've been watching the a lot of the retro computer youtubers and there's a lot of stuff that you can find out about the sinclair machines in the uk but not much about uh portugal and i didn't realize that there's a really rich story there that should be told. It's being it's being done. The only problem is this: uh, because the museum project is a project made in partnership with the city hall, we've made the decision um, until now to, to speak in Portuguese, um, and that's obviously makes it harder for people interested from abroad. Now, what we are doing this year is to uh, try, try to do at least a kind of a best of from time to time with contents that are uh, subtitled. Uh, so that's something we want to do this year because obviously you guys are here, you guys are interested. I want to, to share whatever I find out. Now, that's more on what we publish. Of course, there's a lot more that we don't publish. I told here in the, in the last meeting that I was, that just for paperwork from Timex people, we are uh, with around 2000 PDF files already scanned. Uh, and so there's a lot of things we've been finding and we will share, but now we need to define the best way. For example, we are thinking and trying to get support for a film documentary international uh, where we cover this. We are obviously considering writing a book and obviously, I know if it is about Timex, it should have a version in English. So there's a lot of that can be done. It will take time. It will take a lot of effort. But uh, we are trying to do that. Well, I earlier, earlier, you said that, uh, earlier, you said that uh, in Portugal, you had Timex and uh, Sinclair. Um, from my perspective, I've lived in Morocco and in France, and we only had Sinclair. I'm, I don't think I remember when I was a kid, uh, anyone having a, a Timex. So uh, in Portugal, you were using both machines? Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you had could a factory have there. Yeah, is... I, I know that there was a factory, but sometimes uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. In Spain, I, I I haven't seen any any Timex neither. No, I know it. I know it only from the retro community. Otherwise, um... yeah. So wh where did you add factories from Timex? Dundee, Portugal, France at at, at a factory. I don't know what they were doing, but they had Hong Kong, many other places. Where were they making computers that we know? Dundee. Portugal, those two were the, let's say, the main ones, Dundee for the UK market, Portugal for the other markets, um, not taking obviously all the relevance from what happened in UK or in US where they were designing it originally and all of that. And there are for sure some things made in France because I think I, I, I have or I saw one or two Timex machines made in France. So they were doing something, but it's not a, a development center as far as we know. So having said that, you don't find them in Spain or the ones that you find are the ones that were sent across the border because people were, let's say, forbidden to do it. But I, I keep hearing stories about smuggling computers across borders uh, for, for, for Spain without being able to do it, but they did it. Even directors at Timex had companies doing those kind of things. So the, the, those things happen, but they are the exception. So. In Portugal was different because remember this for so in the later years they were developing the Timex models, but they were many times assembling the spectrum machines. Many of the machines assembled in Dundee, parts of it were also done here because Timex would manage that uh, that workload. So that means that distributors over here would go to the factory and buy machines and sometimes they could buy I, I don't know the details of that part but they could buy timex or they could buy spectrum machines but even before timex in portugal starts assembling the computers 
you add the importers. So we had the first importer distributor importer in Portugal that started with the ZX80 and then ZX81. So when the ZX81 was launched, there was nothing happening in Timex Portugal related to the computers. It took some more time. So that's why you have both. And people refer to the Spectrum as any of them. I had some friends with Timex, but I, I don't live in Lisbon where the factory was. So probably I was not so affected for, uh, from that. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Adam, I think you had a question. Um, well, I always have questions, but nothing <laughs> probably important right now. So I know I want to see what you're trying to show us, David. What, what was oh, that? OK, great. Let me go back to that. So why am I not? Oh, there we go. OK, uh, so this one is a this is a Harlequin that that um, they're both Harlequins that that Joao was talking about. Um, this one I've not finished populating, and this one has 128k of RAM and an IDE interface over here on the right. Um, I'm not sure what else is special about this, but this form factor is the uh, you know the Spectrum 48k size. Uh, circuit board so you can drop this into you know an old spectrum 48k case or you can get a new case from um retro retroleum or something like that there's a website in the uk or this zx guy's... renew for example oh is it right right zx renew right yes yeah, yeah. it's uh, peter smith he was in the museum two weeks ago or so he's a scottish guy but he's friend of the guy that does that who's called george george is a serbian guy yeah he's lived in china okay so that's why he was able to get all the cases made yeah so he's right so he's having new cases made and new membranes and the new rubbery bits and the new little metal bit that goes over yeah you it's get the serbian whole thing guy it's crazy <laughs> um it is so so and this one did, um, sorry it did the uh, omni zx omni which is yeah. a laptop yeah yeah which is more craziness yeah um and so this one is uh he calls it a nuvo i'm not sure what uh i have know. one it's a 128k machine yeah it's 128k this one has a built-in uh div mmc so there's the little uh xilinx uh cpld maybe uh and the sd card connector um i don't think this one works yet i think that when i turn this one on it gives off uh, uh, a garbage screen so I got to figure out what's wrong with it but I do I did manage to assemble one um, what did I do with that no I put it somewhere um, but I did manage to assemble one and get it working and it's a fun thing you know you like the squishy keyboard and whatnot uh, <clears throat> it's it David what's the video output on those so well so it's both of these your pal oh uh, it's switchable and oh. in this in this case this switch right here selects but no this switch selects between ntsc or pal uh on this one i think i think you use a jumper to select uh but but the all the magic happens right here in this little analog devices chip it's an ad 724R, uh, and depending upon what kind of crystal you hook it up to, it generates NTSC or PAL, and that's that's how that that works out. And then uh, the way that Don designed this, this thing generates the composite video, and you'll notice that there's no RCA connector on here. The composite is actually coming out at the board edge on these two ports uh rgb goes uh comes out through that that funky little video. connector i can't remember what this nine pin is it might also be video but i don't it's, it's i think that I might think be a joke um, i think it's a that kind of ps2 connector it's for s video and sometimes you use a cable that converts as s video to at least here to the SCART signal that you put to with an RCA or a yeah, I'd have to I'd have to go back to the the uh, schematic that he gives for it. 
Um, and then this one has uh, composite out and S video. Yeah, that looks like an S video connector out. And now, David, so did you are they the exact same board and you hooked it or you put different components on it because it's optional or are there different variants? Don has designed like I want to say 10 versions of this. And and it's not entirely clear to me why he keeps making new ones, but he keeps making new ones. <laughs> no, that's that's not true. So it's a hardware the, guy. That's what that's what hardware guys do. That's what hardware guys exactly. No, so yep. so one of the things that that um you know that that he has done clearly is uh he started with with the very basic 48k model. And then from there he started adding features. So this is actually this one has 120k of RAM and it'll boot into 48k mode, but it will also boot into uh, and emulate a Spectrum uh, 128k. Uh, and then I have no earthly idea what, because uh, it, it's been so long since I looked at the schematic for this. Um, I have no earthly idea what the story is with the IDE interface. This might be the div IDE, which is the predecessor to the div MMC. MMC. Did I pause, did I lose video? Let me, uh, nope. okay. Um, and then, um, you know, and then with this one, he adds a, you know, a div MMC um, and the ROM chip, I think that's the ROM, the SST chip, um, uh, lets you put in multiple spectrum ROM images. And then he also adds the uh, AY, uh, this is a 8912 sound chip. There's a couple of variations and this is the 28 pin version. Um, and so like some of these, well, no, all these chips are part of what goes into the OLA. And in a, in a regular 48K spectrum, you'd have a row of uh, 4116 RAM chips, I think. Uh, down here, and you know, a ULA over here, and clearly, it's all ULA Actually, placement. David, I I think you have kind of lost video because it's it's just frozen on. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me try uh, sharing it again. Let's see. Did it takes a second, or did my phone just decide to? Uh, my phone decided to take a nap. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid technology. <laughs> anyway, it's it's you know it's it's fun if you like soldering, um, but there's there's like a, a group, a Harlequin group on Facebook, and the problems that I've encountered in terms of you, you power it up and you just sort of get this random uh, uh, color blocks mode. It doesn't actually boot. Uh, it seems to be pretty pretty common, and I think it's really down to you have to buy uh, exactly the chips that he specifies for that board because the timing is so sensitive. And, you know, the difference between LS devices and HCT devices and HC devices is just enough to throw it off. And so you really do have to be very careful and get exactly the right thing. I bet that's specifically important with the RAM being like 70 nanoseconds or something, which or 120 it, nanoseconds from that time period. Oh no, the RAM is the RAM is really not the issue. It's oh. it's, the, it's the TTL that makes up the um, the the ULA, you know, because video timing is the real issue. Uh, you know, in terms of memory access, is not a problem because, like you said, the RAM chips now are way faster, so they can deliver the data on time and. You know, hang around while the CPU finally picks it up, as right. it were. Struggles to keep up. Uh, you know, right? I mean, they don't. The ranch chips don't care. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it gets there faster, and you know, um, and then the CPU says, "Okay, I'll take it now." Uh, but really, um, it's it's those those glue chips that you know make up what is the equivalent of the ULA. I thought um, I wouldn't see bleeding edge TTL design past maybe the mid 70s but there it is <laughs> there you go exactly <laughs> well and if i recall correctly um you know don is is pretty clear about you know he, he wants you to use you know most of these are hc devices and you know 
you can't really mix uh you can sort of mix hc with some other stuff but you know it's not meant to be it's not as good as in, in terms of of the signals um hct is a little bit better in terms of of mixing uh between ttl and cmos hc is cmos and most of the 7400 series are are regular ttl so there's your I nerd out moment. Rick was trying to show us something. Oh, Rick, yeah. what do you got? See this board here? Yeah. A, a ZX81 replacement board. Oh. Uh, a, a no ULA board. And you got to be real specific in what chips you get, like LS and stuff like that there. But, uh, is, is that the minstrel? Oh, that's the, uh, the Mahaja. Oh, interesting. Where did you get that? Uh, I got it out of Germany. Okay. Uh, from uh, Thomas, okay. I forget his name now. Hosslin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a big ZX81 uh, set of craziness people in Germany. <laughs> yes. There, there are some youth, youth groups for that. Will, Will Woodbine mentioned that uh, before. Yeah. There's a, you know, there's, there's a big following uh internationally onto it and uh i'd say well i'll get one in i'll i'll try and build it so <laughs> I, <laughs> Give me i'm pretty else. sure i'm pretty sure clive sinclair is uh, rolling in the, in the <laughs> yeah, so he used to say that his best creation was was the zx81 with four four ic's and now we have one that, <laughs> that puts it back with a lot <laughs> there's there's another one of my uh, projects i'm working on so I got, got the case out of Portugal. Oh, really? You know what? Yeah. Um, name is Alberto somebody. It's a reproduction case? Yeah, it's a reproduction case. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, is it... not <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys know, uh, and I'm not an expert on that, but there are tiny differences in the case molding technique Mm. used in the US and UK versions of the ZX80. Uh, they right. are slightly different. Yeah. I, uh, there's also a board underneath there. It, it came from uh, Germany too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Early, earlier guys were showing uh, like a ZX81 with the two ports. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can make it out, but the other one, the other one is there. So, <laughs> and uh, that's the one I, my original ZX81 right there. So <laughs> it still works fine. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Rick, um, yeah. is there a need for, what do they do for cases for the ZX81 format boards? Cause I have a lot of ZX81 empty cases, shelves, brand new. Oh yeah. Does anybody Anybody need them for something? I uh, not to worry about. <laughs> okay, I, I so can't that board you out here even interested in Ontario in that you know mm -hmm. stuff. So well, that board you just showed that has the X eighty one form factor. Who's selling that? The, which that? You had a ZX81 form factor board that's current, right? That you were showing. Did I understand that? Yeah, this one that? here. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what do they do? What do they suggest for a case? Um, what are these selling it for? Or? No. Um, what do they use for a case after you build that? Oh, this fits right into a case, right into a stock case. That they're making now? Yes. Oh, okay. No, no, it fits right in. It fit, fits right in this one here. I, I think what Stuart's asking is if you if you just buy that board and you don't have uh, the case already, where, where would you get one? Um, would you have to 3D print it, buy it from them, or could Stuart sell them in bulk to get rid of those suckers? <laughs> I think, Stuart, one, one, one opportunity here, more than the case itself, because the case, well, it's interesting, but I, I have doubts on, the, on if people are looking for it. But it's the membranes. The, the, so I don't know if the, the case you have, they include the keyboard. Um, um, the keyboards are separate. I have about 100 of the membranes. Separate. Okay. 
the the keyboards are very important because it's it's being harder and harder to have access to them. Obviously, if they have a lot of years, you need to. Yeah, there's it. a lot okay. of clones. Uh, people are making them new, right? People have. Yes, they new. are. They are, but because of all the scarcity of uh, components and things like that today, so it's it's not it's you don't find it them all the time. So it's being harder and harder to find, but. Then you have one thing which could be an opportunity because the ones you have are from the ZX81 or the TS. Because the uh, keyboard is the ZX81 from the 81. Yeah. So from ZX81, get in touch with someone like Peter Smith from ZX Renew or something like that, because I'm pretty sure they can they can sell it. Or someone okay. suggested uh, sell my retro, which is a website from a guy called Rich Meller. He's a nice guy also from what I know, a British guy. Get in touch with one of them because if they are okay, I'm pretty sure they can sell them. I bought a few for yeah. repairs on, on mine. So. I just okay. bought a membrane. I won't do yeah. that. Two weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. People like, I guess, Rich Miller and- Sell Rich My Miller Retro. and okay. Peter Smith. I can I can introduce you to Peter easily and Rich also, but I have, I, I'm, I have a good connection with, with Peter. So yeah, uh, yes, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll um, I'll make a little um, sort of an inventory list and send it to you, and you could forward it to them. Yeah, so I'll get in touch with me if they're. Yeah, and I introduce you, and yeah. then you you handle it directly. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Guys, I got. I, I bought. A, I yeah. I bought a lot of parts from the repair center from Sinclair, and then also when I bought the kits, some of the boxes. That I opened, you know, I, I uh, um, had spare parts in them instead of kits. <laughs> so I have ULAs and membrane keyboards and empty shells. And each empty shell has rubber feet and, um, <laughs> and a few components, uh, very weird, like just enough, I think, to, I think it had to do with. Um, tuning the, uh, setting the RF modulator for one or two different settings or something. Did you just, I don't, I'm not sure what it goes, yeah. Did okay. you just bare boards, uh, Stuart? Uh, no, I have uh, maybe six boards and they're not even all the same model. Yeah. There's an entire spectrum of collectors, right? You got the purists who would be looking for all original, you know, to put together or to rebuild all the way up to somebody who wants, you know, just the look and feel, but maybe a, the 128K version versus the 64 and would be willing to put it in an older case. And that's an interesting thing I, I just love about this space is that you can pretty much find somebody who will buy your stuff. <laughs> if, as long yeah. as you can you know, get it to them. Right. Yeah, I have seen people who want, uh, who have collections of just the motherboards, of the PC board, and want every, want every different variation. And I know I've got red ones, and I've got green ones. And I've... <laughs> I have that. I went through that uh, rabbit hole already. <laughs> I'm missing, I think, one or two variations of the 48K only. The 128K I have, the plus 2A, the plus 2B, plus 3, whatever. Yeah, all of those. Uh, it's, it's a lot of things. That's why you start collecting and you think, come on, it's five or six computers. And then you end up with more than one under, then you don't understand why. <laughs> How many so ballys do you have? Know which motherboards? How many ballys? Oh, I just have uh, actually uh, two. I think I used to have many, many, many. Um, but like in in 2005, um, while I was on vacation, they uh, I, everything I owned basically was stolen. And um, so since then, I uh, decided like things can be transient in your life. You don't know how long things are going to be around. And so I just keep just a wee bit of stuff. I'm, I take that back. My wife isn't here. I have a little bit more than a wee bit of stuff, but but it's not as much as I used to have. And um, I used to have like, sadly, like 40 different kinds of systems and stuff like that. And I just, I just have like some Atari 8-bit stuff and my uh, 2068 and my Astrocade and my Amigas, all my many Amigas, but I'm not going to get rid of those. So I think I cut you off, Scott. 
I, I was just going to say that um, uh, I've got a, a palette of probably 20 of the, uh, uh, the Sinclair um, pluses coming from the UK. Uh, in, in, uh, so let me know what color you're missing or which ones you're missing. And uh, I, you, know, you and I can talk about it because I'm not going to be able to repair all of them. Uh, there's uh, several you know, boards that so you just the, can't repair. Yeah, it's from the, the 48K, the rubber key. Uh, oh, okay. So you have, you have something like, I don't know, a dozen at least of different boards because mm. you have issue one, then you have issue two, but yeah. then in issue two, you had all the factory made uh, repairs, the diode fix, the yeah. diode and resistor fix, transistor fix, whatever, in different positions, whatever. Then you have what people call the issue 1.5 which is the, the issue two board with the ULA from the issue one and some correction. Then you have the three, the three B, the four A, the four B, the five, which people thought didn't exist, but we know at least of three. Uh, that's, one, that's one of the few that I'm missing. Then you have the Samsung made ones, uh, three something and the four S, uh, then the six A of course. Then you have the, um, the yellow ones, and in the yellow ones, you have the 4A, the 3B, and the 3. And the 3 is very rare. Uh, I don't have one. I think I have the 3B, not the 3. Uh, I have some in yellow, the 3 in yellow. yellow yeah. it... So if and you're you talking... have the yellow one, remember this... me. If you have an issue 5, I'll fly to the US to, to meet <laughs> you and bring it. <laughs> are they, these are the color of the cases you're talking about? Or are these no, 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 the, color the boards, of the, board. the motherboards. Oh. Yeah. And based on the, the issue of the motherboard and where it was made will be different colors yeah. and then the different layouts and different revisions people, that were made. People are crazy enough to, to check, uh, okay, what kind of uh, capacitors is using uh, yeah. in terms of the ceramic ones. Uh, but then it all depends, like, like, uh, like you were saying, I think we need to respect everyone's intention and motivation to collect. And so, um, it, it, it all depends on what you're trying to say. When people go to the museum and I have the wall with all those boards, I normally don't explain that. I just tell them, look, this is for the crazy guy. Uh, for those that are really crazy and want to discuss about all the board revisions, okay, we have them here. Do I care about it to talk to no regular people? No, I don't care about that. They're all the same. People yeah. will go there, they will look to many computers and say, oh, I had just one like that. And I'm looking and I'm saying, come on, that's a, a, a spectrum from Peru, uh, NTSC model, very rare. And you're right. saying you have one, you don't. <laughs> so, this, but this, you need it, to respect that. So you need to. <laughs> this makes this makes me uh, envy the people who will just, they have an emulator, they turn on yeah, the emulator <laughs> and then they're done. They're like, woohoo. They're much happier. <laughs> <laughs> For example, ZX81, uh, the, so uh, um, Rick is showing it. For example, people in UK, some people will get mad, uh, mad in the, in the good way, uh, drooling, if they see one that says on the PCB, made in Spain, which after investigating it a little bit, it's nothing special. Timex just made a few PCBs in Spain and I know the factory that was used because I contact them and all of that. So I could confirm that, but everyone was puzzled. How can it be that we have PCBs made in Spain for, for the TS or the ZX81 when there was no Timex in Spain, when Investronica didn't do it? So how is this possible? Nothing special. But the fact is that the first time you look at it, you think, whoa, what's this? Is this ultra rare? Am I going to sell it in eBay or what? <laughs> Rick, you might be holding up a fortune in your hand right there. Yeah. You need to go check it out. Yeah, that's an that's a issue of three. I'm at Sinclair. Yeah, the oh, red one. And that looks like a, a replacement ULA, Rick. Yes, it, it looks is. like it's exactly what I saw. Yeah. Is that the VLA? Yes. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. Rick, if it says somewhere, uh, some connection with Canada, I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. As far as I know, there is no, this, no this special. One, this one was made in France. Ah, okay. Okay. So, guys, uh, I'll, I'll have to leave in a while. So, it's dinner time. My wife is calling. So, um, 
for me, it's been a pleasure again. Yeah, uh, totally. I can try to get more people to come because looking at the participants, probably I'm the only one from Europe. Is that true? Uh, Joachim is from France. Oh, okay. Oh, and Joaquim who mentioned also Morocco yep. and France. Yep. Okay. Yep. But yeah, uh, so I, my my schedule was a little crazy the past couple of weeks, but I want to try to do this uh, two weeks after the Monday night meeting. Yeah. So that that yep. would either be the second or third Sunday. I'll figure it out and get a, a permanent calendar set up. Yeah, no worries. I, yeah. I can also try to get more people to to participate. But for yeah, that'd me, be great. personally, yeah. it's a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to be here. With uh, you. Before you tough, I, I, if you're going to get some more people to uh, participate, perhaps uh, since uh, you guys have such a unique uh, perspective from down there, you can get someone who might want to talk about, I don't know, something that's unusual from down there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love to hear about the software that you guys wrote. Well, yeah, that reminds me. Uh, so, uh, Joao, can you talk for a minute about Planet S Sinclair, the website? Yeah, precisely. Yeah, that 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 would be the right guys to talk. So, Andrea, which is the founder of Planet Planeta Sinclair, so it's Planet in Portuguese, Planeta Sinclair. Uh, you used to have a website called Planet Sinclair by a guy called Chris Owens, which I tried to contact by all means, but I, but I can't. Uh, he had an amazing uh, website about Sinclair creations, that other guy. But so it's not related one to the other. So uh, Planeta Sinclair, it's a Portuguese blog, which was founded in 2016, I think, by this guy, Andre Leão. And um, the funny thing is, it's one of the most dynamic and more active uh, blogs in terms of spectrum news uh, in the world, but obviously mostly here in Europe. But the funny thing is it's written in Portuguese and most of the traffic is, is not from Portugal. So there's a lot of people from abroad accessing it with Google Translator and things like that. Uh, now, Andre, I normally say if I die, Andre is the only guy that I trust to keep going with the museum because he's really a, a guy with the right motivation. His intentions are very noble, which is to preserve the story about the Portuguese programmers. Uh, he's not, uh, he's a manager guy, so he studied economics and managing, so it's, he's not a, a computer guy uh, in terms of training. But the fact he grew up with the spectrum, he loves the gaming, he writes very well. And so we start doing a couple of things. One, reviews of games like Crash and all the magazines would do. And he's very uh, mean sometimes. So, but people kind of like that. And that gives a lot of, of attention. So he's also beta tester for many of the new games. So he's pretty much involved with all the teams from Eastern Europe, uh, Spain, Brazil, where most of the games are being made some in the UK, but uh, Eastern Europe is, and Spain are, it's the most dynamic communities. Uh, and so he's even, like I said before, he's invited to competitions like the Yandex in, in Russia and things like that. So the guy pretty much has that part, which is not what he likes most, but it's what gives a lot of visibility. And then what he likes most is, is the preservation. Now the preservation, uh, focus a lot in Portugal, but not only. So he's a very uh, active member of Spectrum Computing, which is a, a kind of a replacement for World of Spectrum. He's led by a guy, I think it's Dave Hughes or some, something like that. And Andre is a good friend of him. So they preserve all kinds of software. So, um, um, so bottom line, you go to this Planeta Sinclair blog and you get something like four or five posts per day, at least with new content. So everyone that has a YouTube channel will monitor it and talk about what's happening and all that. And so then Andre focus on the Portuguese part, which is basically what to go uh, like what, what David did. So to go and read all the newspapers and supplements for computing that we had back in the days to find the name of the programmers, to contact them by LinkedIn, by all other means, uh, chase them, try to ask them if they, if they still have the tapes, because people are surprised. You're not going to really chase them, I hope. But come back here, come back no, here. Not chase like that, <laughs> yeah, but people get very, let's say, they, they find it very awkward that they get a phone call saying, remember this thing you did 40 years ago? I know about that and I want to preserve it. Do you still have a tape? And they, they are, what? 
Uh, but this happens a lot. The book that he wrote was precise with, with all these words. So the tape still works. So we, he came up with a process to basically digitalize the tapes and treat the sound and uh, fine tune it. And it still works most of the time. For the ZX81, it's much harder, but it works. And he describes how he, how he does it. And, um, and so then they preserve the magazines and they preserve the software. The software in Portugal, it's not always games. It's a lot of um, uh, educational software uh, that people would code for many, many different things, uh, accounting, uh, engineering, things like that. And so they preserve all of that. Now, it's, it's a, an a, it's a obvious compl complement to the museum or the museum became an obvious complement to them. We just, I, I normally explain that we just didn't merge the project because we didn't felt the need to. But the fact is a museum needs to have preservation efforts. So I got that by uh, working with them. And so Andre became one of my best friends uh, and, um, and someone that I really trust on this. So the, I will invite him. I know that he doesn't like to, to talk in English, but that's the, the problem, but I'll try to convince him. And uh, there's a lot that he can, he can explain about that. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing work. So please take a look at Planeta Sinclair with Google Translator. I think you'll like it from, from time to time. So, so I did exactly that. And, and um, I think I got through about 16 pages worth of, of blog posts. Uh, and, and it's it's what Joao said, it's really interesting. There's a, a mix of, you know, a lot of old preserved stuff, some of its games. Um, there's there's an incredible quantity of educational stuff. I mean, the, the, what I saw, I must have, you know, hit the, the, the geometry section of, you know, the math uh, section math. Of, of education software. Um, but there's also the brand new stuff, you know, all the, the new programs that, that folks are making for the, the spectrum, um, yep. which are really, really impressive. Uh, <clears throat> One thing they came up with and we supported and I helped a lot on that was the GOTI game of the year. So they mm -hmm. were doing it from the beginning. I didn't know this, to be honest. They were doing it from the early days. But two years ago, they basically gave me a call and said, let's do a ceremony. And look, I'm very ambitious. So I told them, let's do the Oscars. We, we have to do the Oscars of the ZX Spectrum Gaming. So we did our first live event. I spent one month studying Streamlabs OBS and things like that to do lives, which I didn't know. And we did it and it went okay. And this year we did the second um, edition and uh, was very successful also. First year, the Oliver Twins from the DZ a game from with a new one called Wonderful Dizzy won it. This year was a Eastern Europe team that makes the the best games that we ever saw. Hey, so they made it. They made a new Dizzy game for the Spectrum, or yeah, for they did. Uh, oh, wow. Not only them, but they are involved, of course, and then a lot oh. of other people. Uh, they did a Wonderful Dizzy that was the, the winner of the Gotti from the other year. 2020. Um, and so the ceremony now is organized from Planeta Sinclair and the museum. But the museum is kind of more of the host and uh, we, we, make the, we make the event happen. But the ones that know about classifying games and doing all those kind of things is Andre and his, and his team. So I, I mentioned Andre a lot. The project is not only him. There are others involved, but he's clearly the one pushing it forward. I'm just copying uh, can, the yeah, URL for the. You have the link, right, David? Yep. You can share. Yep. I'm just digging it up right now. Ah, uh, yeah. Someone wrote it. Uh, you, you wrote it, or yeah. I and... think I can hear your wife from here. Actually, is that her? Is that her calling? <laughs> no, not possible. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, no, it's not mine. <laughs> no, those are the birds. Yeah, there are some birds. Somewhere. Yes, the birds over here. Um, and you can run this through Google Translate, and it does a real good job. Of, of translating from um, Portuguese to, to English. There's some interesting uh, uh, mistranslations, but you know, it's, it's good enough. So the thing that struck me was, um, you know, in addition to all of the, uh, uh, you know, the sort of the smaller independent stuff is the Portuguese versions of Timex titles, which were, were kind of amusing to see. Um, but then every once in a while, 
there was something uh, American in there. And I, I set aside, you know, a couple of links. I have to go back and dig them up, but um, they're doing a great job of somehow finding and preserving stuff. You know, there's a, yeah. I, I, I read, you know, that it says, oh, you know, this guy has a has a whole box full of tapes, and we're working on it. <laughs> we, yeah, I can, I can, I can explain a, a part of it. So first, the the Portuguese releases from Timex sometimes they are not more then the same tape from us because i get the tape with the original printed uh, sticker and then they put another one on top i have one case where you, where the the new one got out and you see the original one beneath and that happened because the guys from timex portugal would have access to it sometimes they would i imagine translate but the tapes would come to portugal now i'm pretty sure because we were that that's very cultural over here we, we are not like the Spaniards and many other countries where you need to subtitle, where you were forced by a lot to do that. So bottom line, I'm pretty sure they sold uh, US software here. I'm pretty sure that was uh, normal, okay? So you didn't have the Portuguese version or it was not made, you sell the US one and no one cares about that. It's normal, we are used to that. So, um, so that explains another thing, which is so it was normal to have access to it. Obviously, Timex was a group with a lot of connection to US. And then why do we have the tapes and all that? Look, I have almost all the, I have, I think I'm only missing one cartridge uh, for the TS2068. And from the tapes, I have more than half. So I don't have them all. But I remember buying a huge pile of them in US a few years ago, and I, I have many of the titles that were released. I've recently said in a video from the end of the year, I, I was able to get some interesting things because there's this, I don't know if you have this, and I, I haven't read your book in detail yet, David. But so we have the list of what was produced by Timex USA in terms of software, okay, uh, in terms of tapes. Uh, for the TS-1000 and 1500 and for the TS-2068. And they have a, a number, each tape has a code, okay? Now, some of them, there's this Portuguese website, old one called the Timex Computer World, where they have the list of them. And some of them said, they had the code and said unreleased, uh, something like that. I was able to, to find manuals for some of the ones that said unreleased and we didn't even know the name. Now, the manual only means that they were planning to do it. doesn't say if it was launched or not, because I had that from a guy from Timex Portugal. So he could have brought them from the US, but they never, they were never released. I'm not saying but, they were. But they got as far as printing the, the manual. Yeah, I have the yeah. manual. So Crazy. at least that part I've shown already in the video. Um, and so we were able to go even a little bit further from what we knew from the Timex Computer World website, which is from a friend of mine, Johnny, João Encarnat, Johnny Red. Uh, and that guy got access to a lot of things that he donated to the museum, like I, like I think I said in the last uh, meeting. Uh, and I've recorded all of that. And in, the, in between those, there were a lot of tapes. So what I do with every single tape that I'm given now is I give them to Andre and he preserves them. If it's not preserved, he preserves them. So everything the museum has access to or that I buy or that I'm given goes to them. If it's not preserved, it will be preserved. Some of them are sealed tapes. And I have to say, I'm not a purist in that sense. So I don't mind opening it to preserve it. I prefer that than just to have it sealed and we never see it. So we've been doing that to also together as a way to help. And so, yes, so it's, even if it's not Portuguese, it's Timex, so we want to, to preserve it. I normally explain, I don't collect software, but every single thing from Timex and from Sinclair related to the programs and things like that, I try to, uh, to get. Very cool, very cool. Thank you, Joao. Yeah, okay. Well, so if there's okay. no more questions, at least for me, I'll, I'll leave you guys. Yeah, go have dinner. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. lunchtime over here for some folks. <laughs> yeah, it's dinner time here, so I'll I'll be going. So, thank you once once again. I'll see you next time. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the night or the afternoon. Too. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye -bye. Oh, well, right. I have a question. Yeah, question for uh, David. I don't know if we're going to cover this 
an, at all today or if we're going to cover it in two weeks. Um, but I would like to see it covered, uh, which is your work on um, these typing in the programs. So far, you've typed in uh, what, three? Uh, so, you know, actually, um, I, I, I typed in another, a bunch, but I, I typed in one and sent it to the to the group. Hmm. But uh, I one? don't think that uh, there must have been something wrong with it. it was a, so it's a it's a five card stud. Oh, that got sent. To, I haven't tried it. But oh, okay, so I, you saw it. Okay, I was worried. I saw, that... Yeah, I actually downloaded it. Yeah. I oh, okay. Tried it yet, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, Tim, because yeah, like I wrote down, you wrote I I downloaded uh, uh, Stud Poker Clover, okay. which is a video art program, which is my favorite one, and yeah. Obstacle Run, uh, which I tried out and. Figured and you fix the bugs. I guess. I guess you upload a new one eventually. One of these. Well, yes. As soon as I, I get a chance. So, uh, uh, Tim Swenson wrote this article about how to do this sort of thing, and uh, at our what meeting a little while ago, he mentioned um, two weeks ago. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So he talked about that, um, and I thought, oh, I'll uh, you know. I'll start doing this. And it turned out to be really, really easy because, uh, you know, as, as fantastic as the 2068 keyboard is, getting to some of those combinations of, of keys, uh, commands rather, takes, yeah, some of those know, three, keys four are, keystrokes, yeah, right, it. as a challenge. Um, <clears throat> and then and I don't have anything to save it with on the, on the, I mean, I, could, I suppose I could save this tape. So I've been using. Well, don't, can't, don't you uh, have a way to save to a WAV file? That's why I save. Because I do actually uh, type in some stuff on there when I'm messing around with programming. And um, I So well, do I, when, are you using an emulator or are you using the, the actual computer? Real hardware. OK. I, mean, hardware. Yeah, I, I hardly save... ever use the emulator. Oh, right. Save to a WAV file. Sure, I could hook up to Yeah, I just computer. export it to a, well, not export it, but I, I save it to a WAV file and record it. And then sometimes it doesn't always play back. So I'll run it through uh, one of the, um, I mean, they mostly play back, but sometimes they have some stutters, I guess you might say. And then okay. I can just run it through uh, one of the things that archives software and it does a Cleans good it up. job and then you're done. And then you have a TZX file or. A, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, well, so I've been working the other way is I, I use a, you know, a text editor and, and type in the programs, you know, type out the full keywords. And uh, uh, Tim's uh, shell script will convert the five 2068 specific keywords into the key that it, you know, used to be on the spectrum. And then right, it runs like through Zmakes S and, S and which turns it into a uh, tape file, right? And then I load that into Fuse. And that's when I start discovering my my typos, and sometimes I don't discover my typos, and Adam finds them for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Adam's yeah, like, I was surprised this game doesn't play. The one that oh, didn't, that didn't right. let you start the program. I was like, right. I, I went through. I spent like twenty minutes. I'm like, I am just the dumbest guy. Like, I can get this to work. It's it's just me. It's me. <laughs> no, 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 that's that's me making typos. Well, I mean, part of the problem, you know, like with that one in particular, is. It's got a, it's got this reverse text printout, and you know some of those characters I could barely make out, you know, and that was yeah. just sort of a, just a, a best guess. Yeah, I actually there. was looking at that uh, tape because I, I printed, in fact, I printed out. I don't know if you can see it, but this is the obstacle run right here, and I printed it out. Okay. And here's here's the program you typed in. Yeah. And, and um, even when I expanded it on my screen, I could not see how you typed it in because I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at it now and i can't see because it it's too small but when i expanded it and made it large like some of it is just it's not easy to read at it's all a, right it get blurred in the yeah. in the multiple generations that they must have taken to produce their their magazine. right yeah yeah um so yeah i'm working my way through those um i am you know that that um super star trek i'm also working my way through putting in the gazillion let statements it needs and converting the left. So that, and... that one was written for um, uh, Microsoft Basic, so that one's going to require some conversions for sure. Well, right? yeah, no, back in '76, it was more like it was probably HP Basic, or or. Oh, well, even... I think that's a, the and let, if you're using that book, it says in the beginning all those programs were rewritten for Microsoft Basic. If we're talking the big book of games or whatever. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, the the, the more uh, the basic computer games. I actually have more basic. I have this one right here up. 
handy. Okay. Um, oh, I thought you were typing in the one from the big book of basic games because that's from 1984. Yeah, so, no, I know. Like, yeah, that one was standardized. These uh -huh. ones, this one was standardized. In, basic, that's standard, right? Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> uh, this one is is was published in in 79 and um i think somewhere in the intro or oh yeah so the first couple pages are um a description of microsoft basic and then other basics like for instance uh some basics don't have left right and mid string functions right like sinclair yeah, basic the atari doesn't. doesn't even have that atari basic yeah that's right yeah um so you have to do you know you have to do some weirdness you have to use uh two as as your substring function in in sinclair basic um so it'll take a little while but actually david solly shared with me a uh p and p and tzx file let me just double check here yes p and tzx files of star trek written for the um the 1000 and so i i need to download those and try them out he he says they 16K, work 16k i imagine i'm hopefully <laughs> absolutely yeah right yeah. 16k so so here's a funny thing is uh yeah both files are according to google 14k in size which is you know about right um he also gave me a wave file for the thing which is 30 megs <laughs> and the tzx file is 29k <laughs> We, I you cannot can imagine. Easily, you know. I cannot imagine someone typing in thirteen, fourteen k on the Timex on the one thousand or ZX eighty one keyboard. Well, yeah, yeah. That's dedication. I, you know, I, I would type in programs from uh, Timex Sinclair user, uh, but they weren't that big. You know, they might have been. They did require a sixteen k RAM pack, and they did take a long time to type in back in the day. But yeah, I agree with you, Jeff. It's I, I don't know if it's dedication or madness or what. <laughs> you know, speaking of keyboards for the 1000, I was flabbergasted when I was looking at your chapter on uh, hardware expansions for the 1000 and how there's about 10 more than 10, like 100 different keyboards for the 1000. I mean, there are so many and you listed them. I don't know. You probably have missed some too. Like there's I, I, so many of them. There were so many of them. And I yes, exactly. I probably did miss a few. Um, oh, wow, that is awesome. Well, so right, but but right away that you know that was identified as a problem, and and it's in particular in Syntax magazine they would publish uh, articles about how to convert your convert your keyboard, and um, that TI ninety nine four A keyboard that was sold it was sold surplus at um, Radio Shack back in so the, was the the Atom keyboard actually the Atom keyboard oh that's right that's right the Atom yeah. keyboard too, and um, Keith you have the Oric keyboard right. The, the red and black one, which was also available. Yeah, so that, yeah, look, look at what Keith did. He, th that was, a, that keyboard oh. was available at Radio Shack as well. And that's from the Auric. And, um, oh, you cut the door. Uh, you're muted, you're muted. Or is it Keith, just- you're muted, what did you say? Yeah, Keith, you're muted. <laughs> I keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it extends in the uh, door or the cartridge port about a quarter of an inch, but it doesn't yeah. keep anything from working. It still works fine. So how did you um, how did you sort of open up that space? I'm just kind of curious. Well, first of all, I just uh, removed the existing keyboard. I spent a lot of time deciding how I was going to uh, do it. I ended up doing, using a um, uh, one of those. Uh, uh, metal saws that uh bare hand you mean a hacksaw you use the hacksaw <laughs> uh, you, you muted again yeah we lost your your audio again so the, the reason i ask i'm gonna um see if i can show my i'm gonna switch to my video again and there we go so the reason uh why is this vertical anyway okay the reason I ask is because uh, you can see this silver weirdly shaped hole, and this this space goes down about I don't know three eighths of an inch, less than half an inch. 
uh, in the in the case. And so for, for my thing, I just figured out how to make it fit inside. But the Keith, you had to cut all the way over here and all the way out here, right? You probably yeah, took this, uh, this whole thing out. The, uh, the board sits actually on the existing board, but I had to cut places to make it, it allow it to extend to the the distance that it needed to extend to. Okay. Um, when I uh, used it, uh, I I knew all the key strokes for every key without having to think about it. I could do it without any problem. Didn't need to look at the key. Oh, I yeah. I do that now, but uh, eventually I got Jack O'Haney's uh, uh, keyboard uh, or his key program, which if I'd have to use it now if I wanted to use this keyboard because you can type in the keys when uh, spell out all the uh, the words at all of the, all the keys so it, and it worked really well too it doesn't work with hot z though or sh i should say super hot z they both want to take the same location in the oh is that a program or, or a rom replacement uh it, it was a a program oh I, I think i could probably rewrite it so i could be located in the uh the dock bank but uh, not everybody has the dock bank well we can change that <laughs> <laughs> We can figure out how to make a 32k dock bank card. <laughs> oh, I, I have them too, but I use my Airco's uh, 256 dock bank. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Well, it's actually four 64k dock banks is what it is. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. One, one of my cards has one of my uh, Airco cards has 64k. And the other one has 256. Wow. I, I think the Larkin um, RAM disc also uh, uh, use the dock bank, if, if I recall. I think it can. Yeah, I've got the Darkin, uh, the lock, Larkin card that plugs into the cartridge port and then changes the Airco interface into a Larkin interface. Oh, wow. There's a switch. Uh, you have to put a switch in, case, or in it, and it uh, electronically changes it so you can still use the, the Larkin cartridge and make your uh, Airco look like a, a Larkin uh, interface. Wow, wow, that's cool. But yeah, to your point, Adam, yes, you know, the 1000 and the ZX81 keyboards were, uh, they were brutal to type on. <laughs> yeah, in my very short experience with them there. Are... The Memotech version. Oh, yeah, very nice. Oh, is that the blue no. one? Huh? Is that the blue one? Yeah, it's the blue one. I think there's three colors, aren't there? There's, there's blue and black that I'm aware of. Well, this is the uh, all blue. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Was that a, did that come as a kit? No, that was, a, together? that was a. That was a. It was all assembled. Oh. Yeah, it just plugs into the back, and um, you know, there's a ribbon cable that runs around to the to the the case, and they were big on extruded aluminum cases, yeah. which were probably expensive as heck. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, uh, Gladstone Electronics imported some uh kits from from the uk and uh i think that there was a couple folks off the top of my head in the united states who made some kits but most of those things were somehow from the uk like gladstone met had one that um had these uh clear plastic uh uh Sort of lids that went over the key, and there were it was a it was a special kind of keycap made for applications like this, where you needed to put your own label underneath, right? And so the the company that produced those made little labels, and you know you stuck them there, and then the clear case went over the top of it. It was a nifty keyboard that was actually made by a company called Dean in the UK. I have a question. Yeah. I have a device I went through all my Timex stuff and I found something I do not know what it is or what it's for. Does anybody have an idea what this is? Oh, I know exactly what that is. What is so it? that is um that's from a company called C A it's a C A I O. And uh it plugs into the back of your um your 1000, 1000 right? Yeah. And uh one of the things that it would connect to is a special tape uh uh drive that they made it also connected to a printer and um a modem and did they make a did they make a disk drive let me just double check i Adam, had you have, one of you those the way there. back in the day what was that jeff what did you say 
Oh, I'm saying I had one of those interfaces way back in the day, Keith. Oh, okay. What, what did you do with it, Jeff? I didn't even know you I don't had don't want to know. <laughs> 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 okay, so the company was CAI Instruments, I believe. And they sold an Exatron stringy floppy for it. That's right. That's right. And so you've got the I.O. board, Keith. And there was a printer and a modem. And there were some, they sold some EPROMs that you could stick in there to make it do things. Uh, they had a, their own whack ass printer. It looks like a 32 column printer, but on 3.2 inch paper. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, well, isn't that the same kind of paper as the uh, Timex? The, 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 the thermal 20th, paper. Yeah, yeah, they're both thermal, but the twenty, the Timex was a, was a made by, um, uh, was an Alphacom printer, and it used paper that was about four and oh. a third inches wide. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Right. <laughs> All my stuff, I found three packages of Timex paper I had never opened, still down in the basement. Uh, well, I must have been there close to, well, close to forty years. <laughs> It turn, Stuart, it turns you got black, some right? paper made, right? It does turn black over time, but this is, it was all shielded in the dark, so I don't think it, uh, it looks good to me. Yeah, my experience with the old Timex paper, but it works just like new. I was shocked. <laughs> wow. I had, I was selling uh, Alpacom 32 printers that have uh, one roll in it and apologizing for about 20 years saying the paper won't work. <laughs> until I actually needed a printer and I opened it and that paper were fine. So I <laughs> apologize. It, 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 it's not, yeah, it doesn't seem to age without heat, you know? Mm -hmm. But then the, but then the image would fade from what my understanding is over a long time, it would fade. Oh, once it's printed? The, yes, yeah. that I've seen. I've, I've got some that did not fade as long as they were kept out of the light. Okay, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. They're kind of like a gremlin, I suppose, in that way. You know, got to keep them out of the light. <laughs> Don't if feed them nothing has, If anybody has some ZX81s uh, or 1000s that are in need of keyboards to make them complete, um, I I would happily send you um, original membrane keyboards. Um, for the asking, if you know, just have one or two. I have, like I say, I have about a hundred of the original membranes. Um, but also, I I am currently importing tactile keyboards from yes. uh, Carl at Ginger Electronic in Germany. And while they don't, they're not as ergonomically good as a full keyboard. They're pretty. They're a huge improvement over, you know. Uh, the, the membrane keyboards. And I think my cost on those to get them delivered is in a $15 range if anybody wants one for $15 or to try it out. They're pretty good. That little click of each little mechanical keyboard uh, switch um, is a vast improvement, yeah. Stuart, I think I've seen other folks take the, the top of the membrane keyboard and sort of, you know, mush it down on top and it seems to work out okay. Have you tried that yet? Uh, take the top? Yeah, the top uh, layer of the membrane keyboard and put yeah. it on top of, of Carl's keyboard so that you have, you have the oh. labels and stuff. Well, he has reproduced that membrane. Okay. Uh, so his version is, um, is clear and easy to read as the original. Oh, okay. Um, I would imagine that if you tore off the original and put it back over his switches, it's the flexibility is the same. It probably would work. It, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he also has the Z80. Um, I haven't mar marketed that, but I have it. He has Z80 overlays as opposed to ZX81 overlays oh, for the wow. same switch. Uh, Rich. Yeah. Rich and the other Z80 owners, ZX80 owners. <laughs> yeah. 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 Likewise, he, he sells the keyboard to replace the Spectrum. It can go into 1500, and he has overlays for the Spectrum. He doesn't have an overlay for the 1500. Um, so, so the, yeah. 
the ZX80 is like really, really rare then? In the United States, I would okay. say. It was never sold in the United States then? Is that why? Oh, no, it was, yeah. Oh, it was. Yeah, it was, but it was Sinclair that sold it and um, direct Yellow. and there were ads in places like uh, Creative Computing. Okay. Um, my, one of my one of the teachers at, at my junior high school had one and he gave it to a friend of mine about 82 or three. And, uh, you know, by then we were like, yeah, we're not going to use this. <laughs> well, I'm going to get going here in, a, in a, a five minutes, uh, but I, I had a question. I don't know if anyone can answer it or probably uh, this is a dumb question. It's about uh, basic. Um, so uh, the other day I was, I put the, um, and I know that there's OS 64 or whatever, which I'm planning to burn to a cartridge. But um, so the, I, I took basic and you can put it like an out command. I don't remember the number you have to put in and it puts basic into 64 column mode, but yeah. like the top half of the screen gets all messed up. Like, is that normal or is that yes. just, it is yes. normal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I did the same thing as you um, when uh, a friend of mine got one in, in 84, he, I went over and spent an inordinate amount of time at his house playing with his 2068. And uh, somewhere in the manual, it mentions, you know, the out command for, for 64 column mode. But what it doesn't tell you in that man, in the computer manual is that it's still 32, you know, uh, columns and you have to write code to make the display you know, actually show up 64. Uh, so, oh, so you have to write machine language code or? Yeah. Code? Yeah. Oh. yeah. And, and worse, worse yet, the second display file overlays things like minor things like the system variables and, yep. and some other things. So yeah. it, it, I, ideally, if you look at the tech manual, it says you need to use the video mode change service, which mm -hmm. doesn't work. Right. Right. I was say, it's been the manual, the tech manual, and if you follow it, it'll it'll convert everything like you want it to be converted but you still got to write the code that's going to write through both uh, columns yeah yeah that's right so the the video mode change moves as jeff was mentioning some system variables from you know a certain location to the top of ram and then uh you can turn on the second display file which will give you the ability to do 64 columns but right. will not actually give you 64 columns <laughs> but that's what os64 takes care of that's exactly right that's what os64 takes care of yes yeah yeah and it's it's a you know a fairly significant um you know chunk of programming there's example code in the tech manual for uh 64 columns and 40 and 80 <clears throat> um i kind of doubt that that stuff was debugged you know i think it's you know somebody wrote it and because the sprite code it took took two guys a fair amount of time to debug the sprite code and then once they did they sold that as uh as a library that you could you know buy does anyone know how many versions of os64 were produced i i have two different versions 1.7 and 1.72 stuart might you know no. <laughs> no i don't know i don't know <laughs> well Maybe we should chase down Jeff and ask him. Uh, Al Hartman told me uh, he actually talked to Jeff about three weeks ago, and Jeff wanted to join us. He would know. Oh, that'd be great. I, I, I got. I'll see if I can round up Jeff. I haven't talked to him in uh, since the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. It'd be fun to pick his mind, pick his brain about about that, and you know all the other stuff that he did, and and why he just why he saw thought converting that zebra shirt into a muscle shirt was a good idea. <laughs> oh, wow. He, uh, you know, like I say, his favorite thing back then was climbing rocks and uh, glaciers if he could get them, or, or at least, you know, he'd go up to New Falls area in the dead of winter, oh, yeah. like right now, and climb yeah. rocks. <laughs> wow, that's so, crazy. Yeah, he had really strong hands and fingers and yeah. Very cool. So I'm going to uh, ask one more question, then I'm going to get out of here. Uh, so uh, on the div div MMC, mm -hmm. uh, when you put when you boot into the menu, it has like I want to say like you boot into like I guess a soft. I'm guessing it's a software 80 column mode. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Have you booted into that menu? Do you have it? Um, because it's, it's I, definitely not 32. It looks and it looks more than 64, and it's it, all done in software, I presume. That's interesting. I know the DivMMC I have doesn't. Well, I don't use the menu. Oh, <laughs> so you don't. I'm sorry. How do you I load use, software on it? I, I use the oh, uh, with the load and uh, save commands. Oh, because like if you just press the button on the on the back, it just oh the NMI moves button? Into the menu. Oh, oh, right, right. Okay, yeah, you know I don't about? use that. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I use the load command to, to load. So software. you do it the hard way? Is that what I you do it the hard way? Yeah, right. I type dot ls to see what's on the <laughs> on the you know um, uh, SD card. I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. That reminds me. We'll, maybe we'll talk about this next time. Is uh, there's a guy named Andrew Owen who is um, uh, in part responsible for a thing called ULA Plus and has spent a number of years working on a sort of Sinclair Timex inspired computer. He's written an alternative basic called SE basic that runs on the um, on the 2068, you can burn it to a ROM. And um, he's also written a um, uh, an open source alternative to ESX DOS, which is the thing that runs on the div MMS, div MMC and uh, uh, ESX DOS is closed in terms of its development. So you can't get the source for it. Um, and so I looked at its source and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's similar to the extended ROM and it's similar to the interface one ROM in that it's got all the uh, sort of same techniques that are used, especially with the interface one um, in terms of switching itself in at a certain time uh, or at a certain uh, reset point and then taking over things like say, but really actually, as it turns out, all it implements is uh, what he says is, is run with, and then you have to write or port all those commands over. So that menu you're you're seeing uh, is a is a command. Is is some kind of uh, software that somebody has written for? Right. It's actually when you when the menu is actually a program on the um, SD card. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And so is so is the load command, for instance. It's not yeah. built into ESX DOS. It's a it's a it's another command. You, you when you type dot load or whatever. It goes and gets this thing, and then that runs and loads the software into your computer. Uh, that uh, I'm going to take off here, but I did want to say one thing. Uh, last time we were on on here, or maybe a month ago, David, you asked me uh, whether I could get uh, TZX files to load from yeah. my given, and I if I haven't, so okay. I don't know if I don't know how or if it's is it, only, is it, it only TAP files through. that it loads? Uh, that's what I've been able to load. I don't. Okay. It's possible that it can load TZX, but if it if there is, I don't know how. I don't think so because of the compression. I think okay. that may be the issue. Because this, yeah, I think those are compressed files. Um, yeah, but actually, I, it's four o'clock, so I'm kicking y'all off. Okay. <laughs> it's good to talk to everyone. I'll see you next time. Oh, and right. David, uh, please save the, uh, what yes. do you call it, the, if you can. The, yes. Yeah. The, the cool. chat? Yes. Yeah, save the chat. Yes. I All will right. do that. I'm out of here. All, All right. right. Have a good afternoon, guys. Bye. Have a good afternoon, guys. Have a good dinner, whatever time it is for you. <laughs>